you for joining us for our next health lecture in our lecture series, which will today be on hair loss. So we're going to look at the different types of hair loss, the different types of treatments, and also we're doing a bit on traction alopecia in particular. Today I wanted to take you through a variety of the hair loss conditions there are, uh, what might trigger it, what might cause it, how you might notice it. Um, and then have a little emphasis on traction alopecia because that's one of the hair loss conditions that actually is preventable. Okay. Now, a couple of facts. 100,000 to 150,000 hair follicles across the scalp. So we have loads of hair follicles across the scalp. Um, and actually, day-to-day -day shedding of your hair, where it's coming from the root out, um, isn't that noticeable. You know, we shed hair all the time. On average, about 100 hairs a day in fact, um, but when it increases from that level, that's when you start to notice it and when it's considered hair loss rather than just general shedding. 85% um, of our hairs on our head are in the growing phase, which is why when you tug it, it's not going to fall out instantly. Okay? When that percentage shifts and we have a higher percentage of hairs um, in the shedding phase, that's when we can notice a problem and when it might be quite shocking that hair is falling out. Okay. And once again, just to sort of reiterate the importance that hair does play for us, 43% of people, um, this was an American study interviewed, said that they would prefer to have thicker hair over more money in their packet, in their wage packet every month, which just shows really the importance. Sometimes people say it's linked to whether they're going to have a thicker pay packet because they see, you know, it's Seeing, being seen as more desirable, more likely to be hired, um, and that's a stigma we need to challenge anyway in a separate conversation, but um, certainly just emphasising the importance hair plays. So if we go on to the next page, we've got, um, we're going to start looking at the different types of hair loss. Now, all these photos are patients that I've seen in my clinic. Um, some of those photos show, so we'll go round, we'll start with this lady at the top. That photo is of hair loss that is recoverable, um, but is down to more hairs entering into the shedding phase than would normally be usual. So she saw a lot of hair loss, uh, got quite worried about it, but eventually what you start to see is hair regrowing coming through again. So they're little baby hairs, they often look quite spiky, poking out of the hairline, um, but they do regrow. So that's, you know, a really happy thing that we can tell her <laughs> it's going to recover. Um, moving next door to that lady, we've got female pattern baldness. So many people think that um, pattern baldness is just affecting men. It's more common in men, definitely but it can also affect women as well. And what you see is an overall sparseness of hair on the top of the head rather than complete baldness. Um, you tend to notice it particularly if you put parting down the middle and you'll see the parting get wider and wider, weaker and weaker. Um, and that's genetic, that's a genetic condition. So not a lot that we can do to change that at the moment. We don't have gene therapy hitting the NHS anytime soon. Um, but there are certain medications that may be effective if you're an individual that is susceptible to it. So that's one that can be explored. If we drop down, we've got um, our classic traction alopecia. So this is a form of hair loss caused by just really tight hairstyles. Uh, pulling on the hair, um, really tight braiding, extensions, weaves, um, and it's entirely preventable. You simply don't put that tension on the hair or the follicle and you don't have to deal with the, the loss. So um, it can get quite drastic to the point of scarring, but hopefully if you spot it early on enough, then you take away the tension and you allow the follicles to actually recover and they can do in full. If we drop down to the bottom photo, we've got a hair loss condition that we call alopecia areata. And that is an example of a very unpredictable condition. So it can suddenly lose hair and you'll see it in nice clean patches of hair loss. Or you can see it recover suddenly as well. Um, 
it is caused by an autoimmune condition. Uh, so it's that your, your body's immune cells attacking its own follicles. Um, and that's quite hard to then deal with as a treatment because you're trying to dampen down your own body's immune system. How, how do you do that? It's quite tricky. It's a bit like eczema, similar um, problem. Finally, um, coming across to the last two, so if we see the gentleman's head, that's our classic male pattern baldness. It's that classic bald shape. Um, once again, genetically linked and determined by certain follicles being particularly sensitive to a, an enzyme that is reactive to hormones. So a lot of people say, oh, I have so much testosterone and that is why I've lost my hair. But actually, it's not the testosterone that you have. It's an enzyme close to the follicle that is responsive to the testosterone. Um, once again, not a huge amount of treatment available for male pattern baldness unless you are responsive to a particular drug called minoxidil or finasteride, or you're willing to shell out quite a lot of cash for a transplant, which can be expensive but very effective. And uh, finally at the top here, another preventable hair loss. This is um, actually a scarring alopecia. So we called it traumatic scarring alopecia. And it's caused by, a in this case, a chemical burn from a relaxer, which is uh, a chemical treatment applied to the hair to straighten the hair. Uh, the force of that chemical is so strong um, to have the action of straightening bonds in the hair that it can also cause caustic burns on the skin and literally scar the skin. So this lady unfortunately will always have a bald patch there because of the scarring that it's caused um, and the hairs suffered a lot of damage as well because of the chemical relaxer also. Okay. So, um, you know, it... Hair loss can occur tiny spots all over the head. It can occur with diffuse shedding. It can occur maybe temporarily or long term. It's very varied. Any form of hair loss or hair shedding that's greater than expected could be referred to as um, an alopecia of some sort. Temporary hair loss can include, uh, like we mentioned, uh, hair shedding. I don't know if anyone's ever experienced having being very ill and about three months later noticing or experiencing a lot of hair shedding, hair coming out in the hairbrush, maybe every time you wash your hair. Has anyone ever experienced that? Yeah, a few people. Or post having a baby, um, after breastfeeding, when you stop breastfeeding or after giving birth if you're not breastfeeding, same thing can happen. In, in both cases, they've been caused by slightly different things, but it's um, a similar process that's taking place. So you can see the diagram next to, you, next to the point. This is just the classic hair cycle, growth cycle. So you've got an anagen phase, which is your growth phase, a catagen phase, which is the transition phase, and a telogen phase, which is the shedding phase. Now, like we said at the beginning of this lecture, most of your hair should be in this growing phase, which is why we've got hair on our head. Um, after an illness, even something with severe stress, such as an, a bereavement or a divorce, um, we can notice that the body will shift more hairs into the shedding phase than is expected. And it does this kind of from a survival point of view, it's basically shunting resources to other parts of the body that need it. This is the hairs prematurely enter the shedding phase, and then, as naturally as expected, three months after, or five to six weeks after, they enter this phase, they shed. A nice thing to know, though, is that the hair is going to recover and regrow. Um, technical name, we, we call this as telogen effluvium, but everyday shedding, you know, any medical practitioner or trichologist will be able to pick up on that. Another example, like I said, patches of hair loss. On occasions, this can be autoimmune. Another classic sort of like sign that you'd see in hair loss is the receding hairline, the hair moving backwards, further backwards. Now, for young men, that's kind of a classic sign of male pattern baldness. Um, but it's not always the case. Um, I had an interesting uh, case of a young, a young gentleman who was Sikh, who had 
stopped practicing his religion and because of wearing his turban so tight had caused scarring and recession along the hairline as well. So it's not always a sign of male pattern baldness. It can be other things and it's really important to know the full sort of history of the patient. Finally, one that people don't often associate as a hair loss condition but is still um, equally as, as troubling emotionally and you know, psychologically is hair breakage. Um, when the hair is very dry, very brittle, and is snapping off. And that can be from over-processing the hair, so it might be that too much colouring treatments or straightening treatments have been done. It can be that the hair has had too many heat treatments, so straighteners are a big fashion at the moment, but previously it would have been blow dryers. Um, or it's something more to do with your health. So there are certain health conditions that will leave the hair feeling more brittle and more likely to snap, such as thyroid conditions, um, diabetes. Um, so it's worthwhile if you do notice a sudden change in the um, texture of your hair, probably coupled with a couple of other symptoms as well that I'm hoping would be more noticeable, that you check out your health as well. You've got more permanent types of hair shedding, hair loss rather. So these can be permanent or to the extent that they're starting to become scarring now. Um, when we see irregular patches, like we noticed before, it can be more to do with um, damage caused by chemicals, heat, um, things being yanked out of the head when they really weren't meant to be. Uh, other sort of irregular patches also um, can be down to more autoimmune conditions. So we talked about one, which was alopecia areata, and that's like quite cli clean, um, circular patches of hair loss. Mm -hmm. But we can also see um, tracking patches of hair loss. Uh, one of those is called pseudopilade. Once again, you don't need to remember any of these names, but it's just for interest. Um, and the inflammation that's happening under the skin is tracking further along the scalp causing scarring as it goes, as it's destroying those follicles um, as it passes through. So it's very hard to control um, and quite hard to treat as well. It's, it's relatively unpredictable to treat. Um, and we're still, because it's so rare, not a huge amount of research or funding goes into the treatments of it. So it's, it's quite a tricky one when you do have the patient presenting with that. Um, Another one that we see which is more genetically linked, more, so you're going to be genetically predisposed to it, is the one that famously Gail Porter had, which was alopecia totalis, um, leading into universalis. So that is a complete loss of hair. And it may start as patches, but will develop into complete loss. Um, when it's totalis, it's complete loss along the head. When it develops into alopecia universalis, that's eyelashes, eyebrows gone, facial hair, pubic hair, any hair on the body gone. Um, and usually there's, there's very low chance of, of full recovery after this does present completely. So there are occasions where it will grow back a little bit and then it will occur again. Once again, the un unpredictability of this condition is what's, I guess, the most hard to deal with. So on from there, um, there are a couple of <coughs> options for treatments. One of them may be that, that it simply resolves itself, which in the case of hair shedding, um, say based on like post-baby, your hormone levels are going to re-establish themselves and therefore your hair is going to recover as well. Okay? So you don't need to do a huge amount there. Um, if you've had blood tests, for example, and you've seen that your iron's fine, your vitamin D's fine, vitamin B's fine, and actually, this all kicked off after an illness three months ago. As long as that illness has been dealt with and you're recovering okay, once again, you should see recovery um, coming through with your hair as well. So you don't always have to do something to see a resolution. All right? Um, the next thing would be uh, the use of topical treatments or tablets. And those are usually um, the two drugs, finasteride or minoxidil. And they are very commonly used to treat male pattern baldness or female pattern baldness. Minoxidil acts to literally block that enzyme and stop dihydrotestosterone from coming into 
contact with the follicle. Okay, so it can work, not for everyone. Efficacy rate is pretty low, actually. Um, I think it's about 40% see regrowth. Another 40% say the hair stays the same, and 20% see no difference and further hair loss um, as it would normally progress. So it's, it is not for everyone, but it's certainly worth giving a try for six months to a year to see if it does have an impact if you are, certain, especially younger women or younger men who are experiencing this, and it's um, in the relatively early stages. Um, another treatment option is uh, injections, so steroid injections, corticosteroid injections, and that is used um, to control the inflammation that may be happening under the surface of the skin, which is attacking the follicle. So in the case of autoimmune conditions, um, there's a lot of uh, white blood cells attacking the follicles. For what reason? We really don't know what's triggered the, the body to attack itself. But what we can do is limit how much it can attack. So we use corticosteroid injections there to reduce the inflammation. Another uh, treatment option is to, and this is particularly in the case of traction alopecia, so that is hair loss caused by real tension or pulling to the scalp, is simply to take away that tension. Um, so reducing the use of quite aggressive hairstyles like braids, weaves, um, <coughs> tight or heavy long locks as well. It's um, about reducing that tension. <coughs> so even if with things like ballerinas, tying their hair tight in, in buns, we're seeing traction alopecia. With children where their hair is being pulled into tight little bunches, we're seeing traction alopecia on children. You know? So it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to take a long time to develop. And finally, uh, the more drastic and um, sort of expensive route is hair transplantation. So that is, it's become really, really um, innovative in, in the way they do it now. It's much more efficient um, and it's much more realistic in its um, finished product look. So they will, um, remove individual follicles from a donor site which may, is usually at the back of the head where the hair is thickest and not affected by hair loss or any other site where the hair is not affected by hair loss. They'll remove individual cells and then re-implant them into the area that is affected by hair loss and it's done all pretty much all robotically now so it's incredibly precise in that and they can also make sure the distribution of the hairs is really even so it doesn't look sort of really intensely thick at the front and then a bit sparse at the back and overall dodgy. Um, it's very impressively done nowadays uh, but it does cost a lot and there's a huge market in other countries such as Turkey um, where it's become a bit of a tourism for going over and having a hair transplant done on a very cheap um, budget um, you'll find that a lot of the technicians there aren't actually doctors or surgeons doing the transplantation, so it comes at a cost, um, even though it's cheaper. <laughs>